It was just a long haul, and I didn't. I didn't want to be in Norfolk. I wasn't. I wasn't the Norfolk businessman. I guess yeah. you could say. It's a different feel. It is a very different. Totally feel. different. Yeah. So we moved out here. This building opened up in this space, and we did a, a little build out here. And this is beautiful. Absolutely thank you. gorgeous. Thank you. I walked in. I was like, it. I need to step up our game. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's funny, Dave, that in the financial business. The way something looks shouldn't matter. It should be like, what's up mm -hmm. here? What can this guy provide being his gray matter? Mm -hmm. But people want to come in and feel like it's it's home and it's professional. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, you know, I, I did that. This was my whole design with the shell that they gave me. And then Ian, Ian, uh, your employee, my son-in-law. <laughs> I love that guy. He's he's awesome, and he's just a good human being. Yep. And... You know, this whole set here is like his initial brainchild. And then my son, Jacob, follows up with that, you know, that kind of mentality. There's just guys like you mm -hmm. that have that mindset and that, you know, my, my thing is finance, mm -hmm. right? So if you know your lane, you stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. um, and then when, when you want to grow, you want to do something different, you find experts. And I always try to find people that I believe are smarter than me. <laughs> But you surrounded yourself with your kids, though. <laughs> you got right. a bunch of brilliant kids. I do. I really do believe my, my kids are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. And, Jacob, you can edit that. Yeah, I'll cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how is it working with your dad? I mean, you I've know, had, careful, had, let's careful, have this Jim. conversation without him in the careful. room, right? <laughs> I've had a couple stints at it, but uh, it it is, it, it of course has its uh perks and it's uh uh i guess cons but uh majority perks i would you say get a it's, lot of time off yeah i know that <laughs> well when <laughs> you know that that could go either yeah, way that's right you know. <laughs> business trips can sometimes turn into family trips which which is fun so <laughs> that's awesome you know the great thing about really having your kids on payroll is that i can look the internal revenue service in the face and go this is a business trip with my family we're all on payroll we're it's we're working. talking business. We're working, right? Mm -hmm. We're having fun, and there's no law against having fun and getting a tax break for it. Yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, like uh, professional athletes have fun every night on the basketball floor, the football field, mm -hmm. and th there's there's tax breaks for that specific world. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, I mean, you guys are together every day, so holidays are. <laughs> Oh, Dad, do we have to do the Christmas dinner? <laughs> I well, see you every day. The crazy thing, Dave, is I, you know, Jake's here four days out of the week, and then he he gives time back to our church, oh. or, or really his, his church where he worships now. Um, but we were there for years, so I I, I say that sometimes I, I might piss some people off saying that. But which church? Uh, Wave Church. Wave Church. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, Fantastic church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've done a lot of great things in the community, and um, you know, they've it's 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 a big organization um, that you know is about trying to help people and you know love people the way Jesus loved people. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it it can get the mirror can get fogged a little bit because men get in the way of that. <laughs> um, so true. I don't have anybody in specific <coughs> mind there. I'm not not poking at anybody. So. Yeah. Um, again, when you say something on camera and we're not editing, you gotta, you gotta give all those disclaimers. Um, but yeah, for, for, for Jacob and like Sarah and then my son Isaiah, who's serving, uh, with the 101st Airborne right now. Oh, wow. And, um, he comes home and comes to work with us in March. Oh, wow. Is he getting out? He's getting out. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a whole nother podcast talking about where our military's at. I'm, I'm a prior Marine. Mm. I, I bleed and love my country, the red, white, and blue. I'm all about it. That's awesome. However, you, you know, our nation's military is going through a big transition right now. And it's, um, it's a different environment than when I was in 
almost 30 years ago now. Wow. Um, and the environment that he's sharing with me now that when you're spending more of your time, instead of learning the skill set of being an infantryman, mm -hmm. they're spending time on diversity, right? And I'm like, hey, there, there is no better place in the world to learn diversity than our nation's military. I mean, there are people from all walks of life, guys who are coming from, hey, your, your choice is go to jail or go in the Marine Corps or the Army, uh, to people who, you know, they, they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth and they go to one of the academies and become, you know, a, a military officer and they're working with guys who are straight off the street. And, right. and then the middle class family whose son's like, I'm not sure I want to go to college. I'm not sure what I want to study, so I'm going to go do the military thing. And, um, you know, our, our family kind of fell into that. I, I was really big with my boys about um, serving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jacob, in, as an example, chose to serve ministry-wise. Mm -hmm. right? He gives a lot of time back to his church that he doesn't get paid for. Right. And I am throwing darts at, at him right now, Dave. All right. <laughs> So I'm just kidding. But no, he really does put a lot of hours in there that's not compensated. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of like a an eternal investment. Right. And then here at the office, to the point of, is it wild around Christmas? I rarely see him. Today is the first time I've seen him really, other than a couple of hours this week, looking at our, our space that we're going to take down. Oh, really? Um. And then Sarah, I spend more time with Sarah probably than than anybody else um, just because she's hand-to-hand -hand with me with our clients. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, our youngest son, Isaiah, is out in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And then our oldest son, Noah, there is in the Coast Guard. He's a he's the – we call him the, the, the brainchild. Like he's got the, a lot of the smart genes of the family. He's doing this intel stuff. And all this geospatial, you know, if, if he told us what he was doing, he'd have to kill us type <laughs> scenario. Um, and he works, even though he's in the Coast Guard, he's working with three-letter agencies, you know, uh, helping keep our, our borders as safe as possible. Wow. He's doing a sucky job down on the Texas border. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <coughs> um, That's all his fault, right? But, yeah, man, we're supposed to be here talking about you well, today. I love, I love the – getting the playing field and who, yeah. what. So you have three boys and a daughter? At three boys and two girls. Two girls. So uh, our youngest daughter, Lizzie, she's the uh, favorite porter, we like to say. <laughs> uh, she was born with a, um, uh, a disability. Um, she's missing a part of her brain called the corpus callosum. Um, so she's got these two hemispheres that don't communicate. Oh, wow. And... Um, I think more people on this planet, if they're like Lizzie, they should be born without a corpus callosum because she is an absolute angel. She's <laughs> She really is. When people meet our family, they gravitate to Lizzie because she has this gravitational pull on just the human being she comes in contact with. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, we all of our kids we love dearly. Mm -hmm but we love them all in a compartmentalization that's hard to explain unless you're a father or mother and you have I kids. I don't have kids. So it's really hard to define, you know, how I can love Jacob the same way I love Lizzie mm -hmm. and the rest of my kids, but different, mm -hmm. right? And it's... Um, We've all accepted we're fighting for second. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always tell, hey, be careful. Lizzie's at the top of the pecking order in the uh, the estate, so mm. she'll uh -oh. be telling all you guys what to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> and where everything is. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's right. But, um, yeah, but th th thanks for uh, being on my show today and being a great guest and interviewing me first. I didn't, I didn't mean for it to turn well, out Well, I just way, so. love, love hearing about And then how did you decide to get into podcasts and doing this covid and this is fun for you this is fun i don't make a dime doing this right. this costs me money mm -hmm. i've never recouped the cost of this studio um i just i'm a curious person about what other people do and it's it's why i love the financial business because i get to ask mm -hmm. a lot of questions and dig in and find and just, out what they're doing and and then i figure out how can i help i find where if a person has has pain how can i help soothe or minimize or mitigate that pain if a person has a, a pleasure 
well, how can I help them make it more pleasurable in their, their finance? Mm -hmm. So there's four quadrants in, in my mind's eye when it comes to business for all of us. We're either dealing with a present pain or we're dealing with a future pain. We're dealing with a present pleasure or we're dealing with a future pleasure mm -hmm. with, with our clients or with our, our, our situations. And so I, I'm in that world all the time of dealing with pain and pleasure and either how do I stop the pain or how do I increase the pleasure? Mm -hmm. Both of those are drivers for getting people to move from where they are mm -hmm. to where they want to be. Unfortunately, Dave, in my opinion, more people in this world are dealing with pain mm -hmm. every day. Pain is the motivating factor for everyone, whether it be physical pain, financial pain, uh, relationship pain. We're, we're trying uh, to move ourselves out of that. And if there's somebody that can come along and, and help who's like taking the position of not, um, not getting overly involved in your situation, but just an outsider who says, hey, have you thought of this? Mm -hmm. Is this an option you would like to try? And I, this is going to sound like on repeat for people that have worked with me in the past, but I say there are three things you can say to me. Kenny, I love everything you've, you've suggested to me. I want to implement 100% of what you've said uh, and what you've advised. Or, Kenny, you know, I like a portion of what you said. So I'm going to implement just a percentage of what you said. Or sometimes there are people who go, you're an absolute idiot. You can go pound sand. Uh, I don't ever want to talk to you again. My job is not to get my feelings hurt. My job is just to go, here's, here's the data. Mm -hmm. Here's the information. Here's the proposal. Here's the strategy, whatever it's called in your, your world. And we deliver information. And we deliver on that information. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the mindset of doing well by doing good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully if that's anything I could ever leave with my kids and people that I surround myself with is trying to do that every day. Mm -hmm. Now, in complete transparency, I've had catastrophic failure at that, right? I've let people down. I've not followed through. And what I have to do as a human being is go, crap, you were a schmuck. Mm -hmm. You know, you screwed that up, take 100% responsibility for that, and then do my best to not let that happen again. Right. It's that crystal ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hindsight, man. Isn't that something? If, yeah. I, if I could look in the rearview mirror and still go forward um, to know what I should be doing next. It, it, but rearview mirror is reflection, right? Mm -hmm. We're able to look back. We're able to see the things that we did well see the things that we screwed up, and if we can truly be honest with ourselves about the things we screwed up, mm -hmm. that actually makes us better than the things that we did well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because when you get a win, you, you celebrate the win, you're all about the win, but, a, you know, like a really good coach mm -hmm. will look at that and go, well, here's the things that we can still improve upon. Absolutely. And and so, you know, from a, from a business professional, that's what I get to do every day with folks. Mm -hmm is to just try to help them get a, a, a little better, 1% better than what they were yesterday. Well, you've said some things that are, you know, amazing. Like, where did you come up with, you know, future pain, today's pain, future pleasure, today's pleasure? Because yeah. just even laying that out and exposing that to somebody, you know, a lot of times they're just not self-aware, so they have no idea where they are and when you say everybody we're dealing with a lot of pain yeah it's because they don't you know know or think about you know that they're dealing with pain yeah. they or there is a pleasure you know they just don't have a clue so they just deal with whatever's coming at them so some of this i learned from uh a defense secretary mm. uh donald rumsfeld <laughs> A serious defense it's, secretary. Yeah, <laughs> very serious. And, and that, I, I would say, there, there were some impactful times during the early part of the war when I, I, I heard this um, briefing that Donald Rumsfeld gave. And, I, you know, as a Marine, I was already out. I wasn't active duty. Mm -hmm. How long and, were you in? Uh, between active duty and reserves, almost 10 years. Oh, wow. 
So a full contract with a an extension and then reserve side on the back side of that. Well, I, I was an infantry Marine. I was with a unit called Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Team hmm. here in Norfolk, which is a uh, part of Marine Corps Security Force Battalion. A at the base, I was a mud on the boots grunt, hmm. right? But we were we were high speed Marines, hmm. and I so fast fast company was the name of our unit, Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Team. Uh, we referred to ourselves and our buddies in the Navy, the the team guys, the SEALs referred to us as fake ass SEAL team. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, you know, we were always kind of trying to keep up with, with those professionals and that that's not easy. Um, and, and they got this special privilege in the SOCOM world mm -hmm. and we were just mud on the boots Marines. At the time, there was not even this special operations command with the Marine Corps called MARSOC now, Marine Special Operations Capable. There was battalion recon and force recon, and that's what every young Marine who wanted to be gung-ho, that's, that's where you wanted to go. Mm. And my, uh, you know, I qualified to be able to go into this unit, but the mindset, if I was going to stay in, was go, go force recon. So I was all about everything military back in the day as a young man. And... Donald Rumsfeld, to me, he was like a badass dude, mm -hmm. man. He just, no nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I remember him in a briefing one time, they were talking about, you know, weapons of mass destruction and what was what was going on in our world during that period. And I remember Rumsfeld talking about the known knowns, the unknown unknowns, the unknown knowns, the known unknowns. <laughs> and he's he's going through these iterations of, you know, you're, you're asking me questions today that I, I know answers to. And then you're asking me questions that I, I know I know some of the answers, but there's a lot of unknown answers. And then there are things I just don't know to know. Mm -hmm. And what I see with business people a lot, Dave, is that I transition that to kind of think about we're in the business world. Even in my business, there's still unknown unknowns. I'm learning every day. And when you and I stop learning or stop exploring what could be possible. I think it's probably one of those signs that says, hey, you, it might be time to retire, retire, <laughs> punch out, do something different. Um, you know, funny, interviewing um, business owners is probably terrific for you too as far as the business goes. So this whole thing is a, you know, an interview and then they're, you know, I'm feeling like, I need you. Yeah, I need your business. That's awesome. <laughs> to help guide, you know, my yeah. future. So, um, you know, I, th I think what you're doing is, you know, being fascinated with businesses and stuff like that. You know, you're just bringing clients in that you can, you know, talk to and yeah. m do future business with. You know, well, I've interviewed a ton of clients that and then ended up, yeah, but on both sides, uh, some that were already clients. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm just curious more about your business. Can I do an interview? Well, I got a government contractor, uh, Mike Ziders, mm -hmm. who's, who's a client of mine. We built his theater. I sat on the board for a while and then I just wasn't adding any value because I was always gone. So I was like, Mike, and he was such a gentleman. He is the nicest guy. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Shout out to Mike Ziders. Oh my God. He took, he told a great story. You know, he's a Naval Academy guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he told a great story in the. Uh, I want to uh, interview him. I want you. <laughs> I want to find out how he got where he is because it's incredible. Watch, watch the podcast. Oh, really? He, he talks about his start. You know, he wanted to be in the music business, mm -hmm. and so he set up a little LLC to do that. Well, he wasn't making any money, mm -hmm. and so with his naval background and going to the Naval Academy and giving his time in. He tells a story about, you know, being interviewed by, um, I don't know, it was a captain or whatever, kind of doing their line inspection of these young cadets and, you know, asking him what he wanted to, to be in the Navy. And Mike was just very blunt with the guy that his idea was, you know, to, to serve his time, take the education that the Navy provided him and go use it somewhere else. Mm. Everybody else was telling him, oh, I want to be, the, you know, this fleet commander. I want to be the next Admiral. CAG, Admiral, and so uh, Mike is a 
an amazing human being who's really taken a business from a, a startup, from nothing, you know, him seeing an opportunity inside a government contract and then that expanding. But he, he tells this story about Cheez-Its <laughs> and that uh, he and his, his lovely wife, Charlotte, um, they were living on a shoestring budget and Cheez-Its were like a, um, that was like a top shelf item in their house. If you could, if you could splurge and eat some Cheez-Its. Mm, it's a big day. That's a big day. And he, I don't want to spoil it for you, but yeah, any of you who are watching or listening, you should go back and listen to that interview from a business man. And if you know, Mike, he's been oh, he's uber successful. But he's been a very giving human being. I mean, that whole Zyder's Great American Dream Theater was his brainchild and his investment. Mm -hmm. I know that firsthand. Yeah. And it wasn't cheap. No. Nope. Um, and th this facility, if you can ever go to Zyder's Great American Dream Theater and see some shows, there's some really great performances there by up-and-coming oh, playwrights and artists. Oh, it's an awesome opportunity. And he's got a state-of-the-art facility there, mm -hmm. and it's intimate. There's, what, 300 and some seats in the yeah. facility. It, it's fantastic. Yeah. And he's, he's our best client ever, hands down. No um, kidding. Oh, yeah. Small well, world. He pulled us out of the... Um, contractor portion of it so instead of um you know because he was passionate about the lighting and the theater and stuff that he yeah. didn't want the waters muddied by you know a general contractor saying oh we've got to cut down on the lighting budget or the you know feel of the theater uh, yeah. financially so it was it was an interesting build it was fantastic and it was wonderful to be able to you know discuss with mike hey this is the way we would do it. This is the best, you know, opportunity for your place. And then also we would say, hey, Mike, no, we don't want to spend that money on that. It's just in in the end, it's not valuable. So with that build, we felt like, you know, we were given, you know, the opportunity to do it right and wow. do it right the first time. So from construction up and yeah. lighting, you were... Yeah, we were directly with him. It wasn't wow. like anything that I've ever experienced. We've always had to go through a general contractor. And the general contractor um, had a very interesting working relationship with us because most of the time he's the boss telling us, you know, right. oh, you've got to be here and do this and the wires have to be in. And, um, you know, he said this is really weird because, you know, I can just – share with you guys and advise you but i don't have any real control over your budget and your decision making process wow it's just really bizarre that's and awesome. it's it's mike it's classic yeah. mike ciders you yeah know? and everybody on that whole build um just it it was a joy for all of us because you know the owner was just so terrific to work with and he understood you know he's real and yeah. you know, he takes everything that you advise and makes decisions, and um, he's just real. It was really wow. great. You know, <clears throat> I um, I got really caught up in us just immediately hitting it off, which is cool. And I forgot to do our, our toast, but thinking of Mike. Oh, I'm as, looking at it. <laughs> yeah, th thinking of uh, of Mike as um, a, a prior veteran. Um, and it makes me just think about folks that I love to interview as well mm -hmm. is veterans who have gone on to do something in, in the um, civilian world. Yeah, private sector. In the private sector. Um, and he's he's been, you know, one of my local heroes who has just crushed it. Oh, and um, But you know, he, he'll probably be mad at me for saying he's crushed it. And so I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, Mike. Um but he's done a great job, and he's just a great human being who who served, served honorably, got out, and, and did great things. Um, and I would like to think that that military background kind of helped him set that mindset. Um, so oh, to, I truly believe it. Did. To, to Mike Ziders. To Mike Ziders. And the rest of our veterans and, and heroes out there who have uh, gone on and, and served our country well. Yeah. And the families mm -hmm. of those veterans, too, that – had to sacrifice all those years of being deployed and being gone. So right. we appreciate you. We thank you. Mm. 
Usually it's uh this is nice in the morning. Johnny Walker Blue Label, but McAllen mm. is tasty. Yummy. Ian's father gave me this bottle. I, let's do one more. We'll finish this off. <laughs> oh. I can't sip it through the whole thing. Well, well okay. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to have another sip now. Oh, <laughs> I am. <laughs> but Ian's father. Has Ian told you about his dad? No. You know, we talk a lot about business. You know, we don't. We don't have that much time to sit and enjoy. Right. One of the things that I'm finding about this podcast that's awesome is you've carved out time. Yeah. And to talk about, you know, whatever you want to talk about and in detail, uninterrupted, you know, so often cocktail parties and stuff, you meet somebody like if I ran into you at a cocktail party, I would right. be glued to you and we'd be interrupted and by the end of the night I'd be like, hey, we need to get together and talk about right. those 400 items, you know. And uh, this is a great venue to be able yeah. to... You know what I love about this too, Dave, is throwing on the headset mm -hmm. because it really does take all the other ambient sound out. So yeah. people go, well, Kenny, why do you why do you wear a headset? I go, because I'm, I feel in totally engaged in just me and you. Plus Joe Rogan looks bad. Plus Joe Rogan is cool. Yeah. <laughs> With a headset on. That, that's right. Well, I got the idea from, from, from Joe going, okay. But he tried it. My understanding is he tried it for a while without the headset mm. and went back to doing it because it does just encapsulate you mm -hmm. and, and pull you in to where if we take these off, you, you just get the ambient sound. Mm -hmm. And I'm like a squirrel, man. I can go off. <laughs> I hear something, and now my mind's somewhere else. So it really does help pull me in. Yeah. Um, There's nothing like the lane of bald, bald guys doing podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and the lighting for bald guys <coughs> is just a big challenge, right? So I Ian, would it be in here trying to soften my My, my dome? Shine? Yeah. yeah, my shine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and um, this beautiful voice that I have today, this is... <clears throat> Due to sickness, <laughs> recovering from sickness, I don't normally have the Barry White, you know, that kind. Hey, of it works for you though, man. Keep <laughs> today, yeah. I'm going to listen to this and go, that wasn't even me. <laughs> <laughs> but today, that's, it's got a good funny. sound. So we do. Remember, we do it not only where you can listen to it, but you can watch yourself. Oh, great! Which is like, oh God, man. <laughs> and the, the camera added forty pounds to me, not <laughs> not twenty. <laughs> Um, all right, so t take me back, Dave. Um, what what an awesome story about Mike Ziders. But take me back to a, a young businessman. Did you even think of yourself as a businessman when you started this? Yeah, everybody said, you know, what do you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a rock star. And no <laughs> kidding. I failed miserably, obviously. But... Um, I get to hang out with rock stars now, so you know that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Do you uh, do you play an instrument? Yeah, I played guitar. Hey, I, Jake, your guitar player. Jake is the best guitar player ever. Oh, that's awesome. Now, this is coming try, from his dad. Try to be. Well, that's great, man. I'll tell you what. I had some kind of disability with guitar. <laughs> I mean, people. I I'm very. I, I have great dexterity. I can. Okay. I know what I'm supposed to do. I can't remember anything, you know. <laughs> we can practice and rehearse. I was in bands, and I'd learn songs, and then the w next week they go, hey, we're going to play that song again. I'm like, w what song? You know, <laughs> how'd it go? <laughs> you know, um, and which is a, a blessing and, uh, you know, a, a curse. I yeah. didn't get to do what I wanted to do, you know, being a rock star. But, you know, with that, some form of disability i ended up you know getting into this business and doing this business and did you, you know, start it from the ground up or did you you buy it from someone or was it kind of a mix of both well um let's how far back do we want to go um 21 years old i was working in a music store and selling guitars and doing that kind of stuff and the owner of the store wanted to do this sound company so he said uh hey you know do you want to do the sound company with me the involvement is you're going to have late hours you know music stores open till seven o'clock at night this thing you rock know, stars want to go to one in the morning yeah, two right. in the morning 
So we started this, and, you know, I'd have to meet him back at the store and unload stuff at 2 in the morning, and after, you know, a couple months of it, he was like, yeah, this isn't working. I don't, <laughs> don't want to get up and meet you at 2 in the morning and unload the truck. And so he said, hey, why don't I sell it to you, and I'll finance you, and you make the payments, and you do this. Hmm. And so... It was an unbelievable opportunity, I thought, at 21 to basically have this business, you know, kind of set up for me. And, uh, you know, he was like, but you are going to make the payments, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you have to find the work to afford this. And so I started doing sound and doing my own business, you know, with him, you know, in the beginning. And then it just went on from there. And it led me down this path. And it wasn't a path that I, you know, looked at and planned and laid it out in front. It was kind of just an opportunity. Yeah. And then it just led me down this road to, you know, where I am now. The uh, the lighting company, um, so I had a sound company. Um, the lighting company came from another opportunity. I My sound company was merged with another big, huge sound company in the area, and I was, they would book, you know, four and five jobs, and they could handle four of the jobs, and that fifth job, they would just say, hey, Dave, you know, take your guys and go do that job. And uh, the owner of that company was in major motion, he's still in major motion pictures, a gentleman named Jay Mahar, and he is... I mean, he's worked with everybody. Anyway, he was on a movie in Malta, I think. And he came back and he asked his partner, why are we writing all these checks to uh, David? You know, the, he should be working for us. We should pay him, you know, his normal rate, but we're yeah. paying him to do all the subcontract work. And uh, he said, yeah, we can't do that anymore. And I'd been working with them for about six, eight months and kind of, put all my eggs in their basket and so they came to me and said yeah we're not going to do this you can work for our company and I was like well I'm investing and spending all this money and developing my business and uh, I said well what am I going to do and hmm. they said well why don't you do lights and I was like cool <laughs> <laughs> I'll do you weren't you weren't a light guy yeah. but it's like well I, I'd always thought that you know the audio world was at this financial level, super expensive, and the return was, you know, modest. And I thought the light guys were not as heavily invested, and their return was better. And then there's this video world, you know, that they make all the money. And right. Very little investment. And so I thought, okay, I'll do lights. So started building this lighting business with them, you know, um, working for them kind of by day and then by night doing this lighting thing and um we just hammered it <laughs> that's awesome that's kind of the so on the, on the sound side were, were you doing engineering like live sound engineering mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's it concerts and yeah. stuff like that so I, I don't know a thing about music jacob will vouch for that <laughs> um i i can fake it on a piano and play i think one chord on a guitar nice and maybe you know one kind of rhythm on a on well, you know, set of drums. You have all the qualifications to be a rock star. You should go for it. <laughs> <laughs> we should do a band of bald-headed dudes, right? <laughs> <laughs> that would be epic. <laughs> <laughs> the lighting could be awesome. But, you know, my, my financial career started with a sound guy, oddly enough. Really? So when I, I left the they Marine They don't have any money. Well, one of them does. Oh, um, and, and that's doing uh, mixing and engineering for other artists. Mm. So, uh, like but, studio stuff. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Live performance, not so much. No, uh, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Live performance is a whole. Yeah. No other money. Ball of wax. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but w what's interesting is that here locally, you know, there was a, there was a few guys who made it big mm -hmm. in the music business. Yeah. Um, a guy named Pharrell, a guy named Chad. I don't know if anybody's ever... N-E-R-D right? people, yeah. <laughs> no one ever really dies. Mm. But uh, a high school friend of mine was uh, 
a kind of self-starter um, sound engineer. Mm. He was also like a up-and-coming uh, producer. Mm. Uh, shout out to Dave Hummel. Do you know Dave Hummel? I know, I know. Do you know Rob Olsh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Dave started with him. He started with a guy named uh, Rob Smith. Mm. I think it was Rob Smith. I can't remember. Bobby Smith. Maybe it was Bobby. Had his own little studio. Earworks. Earworks. Yeah. So Earworks became the studio for Pharrell and Chad when... Actually, wasn't it Master Sound? Master Sound was Rob, right? right. But there was also the early, early stages was Earworks. Uh -huh. And then they quickly, Chad and Pharrell quickly grew outside of mm. that and ended up with Rob mm. and stayed there. Ultimately ended up buying a studio. Yeah. You know, funny thing, I was with a band that recorded at Master Sound. I was their sound guy, but I would hang out with them and go to Master Sound. And Who that's was that? Where I, that was a band back in the 80s called The the Years. The Years. They were um, more like a Beatles kind of band. They, they were, That's where I cut my teeth and no did kidding. live audio. Yeah. So, you know, our region is known, as you're well aware, is known for some pretty big stars who have kind of grown out of the world of Teddy Riley. Yeah, future records. Future, future directors, future <laughs> studios. So I, I know Teddy. Um, but the way I met these guys was through my buddy Dave, who went to high school with me at Greenbrier Christian Academy. Oh, wow. And uh, Dave called me one day early in my career and was like, hey, um, there's these two producers, and I didn't know what a producer was. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you mean a producer? Like a movie producer? And he was, no, they're, they're music producers. And they just signed their first deal. You, you need to come over to the studio and meet these guys. They need some help. Wow, this is like worlds colliding, you know. <laughs> Crazy. It's <laughs> such a small, it is wild a small, world. I, I'd say Hampton Roads is the, the largest small town in the world. Mm, very true. Very um, true. And the more, the longer I live here, the m more these worlds collide you, you know. see the six degrees of yeah, separation right so that's why ridiculous. i'm bringing this up to you i'm like oh you're a sound guy yeah um so i ended up doing some some work and working with chad and pharrell for a number of years um and then they kind of outgrew me right you know if you think about that cfo world zero to 25 million well they went there quick. They, they went there quick <laughs> um it, god bless them it's awesome mm. you know i was honored to to work with them that's so cool and uh for Pharrell referred me to his engineer. Mm. His engineer became a very good friend. We're still great friends today. He's been a client of mine for 20-some years now. His name's Serban. I was just going to say, do you know Serban? I, I talked to Serban yesterday. massively successful. I mean, he's in the stratosphere. You know, people right. are like, you should know him. I'm like, yeah, I'd love to know I him. Have Can I get an autograph? And I'm begging Serban again on the show today with you, Dave to come do an interview with me because he's got a beautiful story mm. about being Romanian mm -hmm. during the Soviet bloc. Oh, wow. And his parents migrating from, and Serban, if I'm getting this wrong, I'm sorry, but from Romania, they were sponsored in Italy. And he, he told me a short story about his parents, um, it's, you know, escaping, for lack of a better term, Romania, it's escaping communism. Um, and being sponsored in Italy, ultimately to Canada, and then Canada, Serban ended up in the U.S., and his, his partner, uh, John Haynes, who's an awesome dude. These are... Excuse me, sorry. Oh, we're, we, we caught it on video. Damn it. <laughs> Let me edit that out. <laughs> <clears throat> That's what makes it beautiful, is people, you know, you know, farting and burping. I can't tell you how many times I farted on set here, so... Yeah. Nice. That's, <laughs> that makes you feel better. <laughs> well, the burping, the bur thanks. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and you have an excuse for burping, too. Oh, so, yeah. You know. Gosh. Not many. You know, I'm just learning about scotch. You know, uh, my uh, father-in-law is, and my brother-in-law, scotch drinkers. My dad's been a scotch drinker all his life. Um, but they would have a cocktail you know, when we'd get a family gathering, and I just thought, oh, well, maybe I ought to learn how, what they're drinking, and I would yeah. taste it, and I'd be like, oh, that's, I'm not digging it. But through that interaction, I've acquired more and more of a taste, and, you know, they like crazy stuff like Lagavulin. Have you ever had that? I had Lagavulin. Uh, it's very peaty, 
and Jake, we got to make a note of that, man. Lagavulin, Lafroy. I, I can't say it right. Le- I think I have had that. Very peaty. Do you like scotch too? I dabble. Uh. The, <laughs> yeah, um, right to, he's uh, he's a pretty good mixer too. You know, with uh, with the spirits. So, oh, nice. Cut yeah. Well, anytime we have a family thing, I'm like, hey, Jake, you know, mix us up something. He and his wife Amber are pretty good. Uh, you know, what what do you mixologists call that? Mi- mixologists? Mixologists. Just yeah. a good old creative over here. That's all. That's right. <laughs> Here's, let's try this. <laughs> let's yeah. see if Dad will like that. You know. Well, usually I have to beg him to make it for me. Like, yeah. he'll come out with the drink. Mm. And I'm like, dude, you know, where's your manners? Make, yeah. You know, <laughs> make me, make hook, me one. Hook, Come on. Hook me up. That's right. Are you an old, I mean, crazy day and age today is old fashions. I love old fashions. I honestly can't be bothered with mixing anymore. I just. <laughs> we can't be bothered. I just do a bullet rye on ice. Ooh. No, and yeah. that's that's it. That's good stuff. But old fashions, I've got the little smoker with mm. the, the, you know, the oak chips, and um, I, I, I like uh, I like Buffalo Trace. I think Jake early on turned turned me on to that. Um, I like Angel's Envy. Mm. Um, Bullet Bullet Rye makes a really nice. Old, do you do you not like old fashions? Oh, or, I love you old go? fashions. It was just crazy. We were we took a trip to um, D.C. to go see. Bocelli, my wife is oh my a God. huge Bocelli fan, so we splurged, and I got her second row tickets. Oh, nice. That you know, was awesome. So we go to the hip bars that are on the rooftop in D.C., and all these young kids, 20-year-olds, are drinking old fashions, and we're like, did we just do a time war? What, what the <laughs> hell? You know? And the bartenders had all the spoons and everything, and I was like, when did this occur? You know, when did... You know, people go back in time and want to do nostalgic drinking. You know, it's wild. But anyway, no, that's cool. That's the great thing about podcasts. We can go off on little tangents and talk I mean, about it. Can we go to like seven or eight o'clock tonight? You yeah. know, because I can fill up, get it rolling. <laughs> yeah. Um, Especially if we're pouring, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, I, Jacob has an errand to run today to go back to ABC. Mm. So, it, you know, the worst case is that we'll we'll do a, a second show. Yeah. Or a third or fourth, you know, whatever it takes. Well, that'd be awesome. Um, but, you know, it's the fun thing is just unraveling stories. Mm-hmm. And what I like about podcasts is just being a fly on the wall of hearing two people communicate, you know, their, their journey. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't get podcasts until I saw Rogan. You know, he's a master at it, and it's just natural for him. It's not like he there's there's no education or school for it that I'm aware of. And well, he's a pretty smart guy, right? Yeah. And you know, fear factor. Yeah, that's his stand up. You know, act um, and whatever other TV stuff he's done. The no, UFC stand up act is hilarious. I love watching him in UFC though. Oh yeah. You know, when you see a dude just get his face caved in and. He's used to seeing, you know, mixed martial arts. And, you know, he's a formidable fighter himself. Um, but he's just such a kind, open human being. Mm-hmm. But to watch him when he's uh, ringside mm-hmm. and see the expressions that he makes when, when a dude just gets annihilated, it's just, to me, I'm like, I want to see the expression from Joe when this dude... Right, put the camera on right. him. Right, yeah. exactly. Um but uh, again, today's show is, is about it's about you, Dave. So you, you're this 21 year old, this dude saying, "Hey, you shouldn't be um, writing him checks." It sounds like that was probably a pain point for you. Yeah, it, um, pivot point. I mean, when it's a good you're good expression, talk, <laughs> pivot point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, when you're you're talking about the, um, you know, pleasure, future pleasure pain future pain you know um that was one of those you know crucial points in my life that i didn't realize was happening you know i didn't feel that dramatic about it it just went oh okay but it changed the course of my life you know forever okay and for the better you know it was awesome and in uh, the moment were you like scared shitless were you was you like what was going through your head well, I guess we need to do this. You know, I'd, <laughs> it was motivating. You know, yeah. I thought 
I had always thought that we needed to go this path. Uh, it's a funny story. A company that I ended up buying, you know, years down the road, I was doing audio for this big concert. I think it was the Flaming Lips at a local venue. <laughs> um, and they're known. I, I didn't know them. I, you know? I have to admit, I don't know the Flaming Lips, so you got me. Do you know the Flaming Lips? Not really, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a no. Okay. Not a not really. It's a no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, anyway... Um, uh, so we're doing this big show, and they had this rider that they had to have these particular lights. And, um, you know, so Dr. Bob's Theatricity was a local lighting vendor that had these moving lights, this new computerized technology. And um, he brought four of the lights in. And I think I was charging something like $1,200 for the sound system in this big, massive concert that we were putting on. And he brings in these four lights, and he was charging like $5,000 for these lights. And the people that putting on the show paid it. And I was just like, I mean, for me to go from $1,100 or $1,150 to $1,200 was like pulling teeth. And then all of a sudden, this guy shows up with these four light fixtures, and he's like, five grand. And they're like, yep, okay, we've got to pay it. And I'm like, what just happened? You know? <laughs> How come, you know, pennies were so important, but now just throwing money at this light? And I thought, oh, I need some of those lights. You know, that's the way to make money. Um, and and it, was the experience with the lights that he had, did it? They were great, great yeah. you know, but, you know, I had the big sound thing. Right. I had <laughs> massive power and all this kind of stuff. And, yeah, um, they were great. And, you know, I thought, no, well, this is probably the trend for the lighting world. So uh, this is the direction that they're going to go in. And so years later, um, when, you know, the guy said, hey, we're not going to pay you for doing this sub work, I went, well, maybe this is the time period I should invest in those lights that I've always Interesting. thought. Yeah, so that's the catalyst, you know. It makes a world of difference in telling a story. If, if things are lit right and i've learned this from ian mm -hmm. and you know i started telling you earlier you know you you really need to spend some time talking to ian it sounds like because you know his background is innate it was it's it's in his dna to be a lighting guy because his mother and father are both in, in your world they're both professors mm -hmm. but they're uh his dad is a professor at liberty university in the film school and his mom is a professor on the writing side mm. Um, and then, you know, his sister Jordan, who used to work for me until she left and went over to CBN, um, ran this part of the show and the podcast. And it was always, I really appreciate it because I could see the difference. I would look at it on a monitor mm -hmm. and see no lights and go, damn, Kenny, you're ugly. Yeah, <laughs> it's flat. Ugly, right. Yeah. And then they'd turn some lights on and go, oh, you, you know. Not so bad. Yeah, that's why you have a beautiful wife. <laughs> um <laughs> Because of the lights. Because of the lights, right? When my lighting wife met me in the lighting of famous Uncle Wells, it just, <laughs> that fluorescent light, she couldn't resist. <laughs> Where do I sign up? That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, lighting does, I mean, in the business world, too, you know, we, we talk about, you know, developing, like, ziders and theaters yeah. and stuff like that. Um, you know, we have churches come to us a lot, especially during the COVID, you know, they wanted to, you know, broadcast and, right. um, you know, get to their parishioners, you know, Sunday morning in their living rooms and stuff like that. And, you know, pastors don't know anything about what well, didn't yeah. for the most part. And, um, you know, they would talk to us about cameras and all this camera, 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 and they wanted to spend so much money on cameras. And we were like, well, actually you can use a lower quality camera, but we need to yeah. put good lighting and give some good depth and, you know, make it, make it beautiful. Then the device that's capturing that image could be of lower quality. It doesn't have to yeah. be. In fact, higher quality cameras with bad lighting um, actually pick up more of the bad lighting and very make it very apparent. Um, where you know, lower quality cameras um, with good lighting look fantastic. So anyway. So you can take an ordinary background, like a cork wall or, you know, some 
weird paint on the wall, but if it's lit right, mm -hmm. you make it look fabulous, fabulous. right? Absolutely. Yeah. And the tricks that you can do with lights, making people think that it's daylight outside by how you oh. cast on a window. You just hit a nerve. We just got back from Las Vegas. Probably the reason I'm sick. Um, One of my favorite places. Oh, my God. <laughs> the Sphere. You, Yo, you got to go in the Sphere. You, it is life-changing, especially if you you know are in this type of industry. I took a couple of my guys because... It's the pinnacle of everything that we yeah. do. Was Ian butt hurt that he didn't go? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Ian's going next year. Is he? <laughs> oh, there yeah. you go, Ian. Yeah. There you go. You're in. Definitely. Um, it was freaking amazing. I um I was out there for the F1 race, and Jacob I took Jacob with me and uh, a couple friends. I heard that was a. It was a shit show. <laughs> yeah. So, Can we sorry, say those was... words. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this this is rated an X rated show, so we can we can curse. Oh, good. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, the pressure's off. Yeah, right. As a good preacher's kid, swearing, you know, it just it sends a lot of mixed messages to people out there. But, um, so the yeah, F one show, the F one show was, um, it wasn't a good show. But no. Clark County, my understanding from my my casino host out there is that they have a 10-year contract with, with Clark County, with Vegas. Oh, wow. And I'm like, well, year one is that changing the minds of uh, the powers that be. And he goes, it's definitely going to be a round table, you know, because all the, the big wigs at the casinos, um, the, the top echelon players, you know, got the mega suites and, you know, got all of their normal experience. Mm-hmm. But their normal experience of being the limo taking them over to, a, you know, Nobu or to some other fancy restaurant or location or even the Sphere was an ordeal traffic-wise. And so Vegas has prided themselves over the years on being um, able to move large amounts of people efficiently. Mm -hmm. F1 didn't work. And then when you talk about the race itself, like the first night on the first round, mm -hmm. the uh, Man, water what? main covers were popping up from the updraft from those cars and destroying <laughs> race cars. Mm -hmm. You know, multi, I don't know if they're multi-million dollar cars, but I think they are. are they? I think so. And it was my first time. It was a new experience for me, and it wasn't a great one. Oh, wow. Um, and so Jacob and I went out. His friend, who's a big F1 guy, um, I, I, <clears throat> I went to one little part of it and I didn't even go to the race. We, we left early. Oh, wow. We came home and I know that's not a good, you know, I like F1 and it seems cool. I just wish we'd have done it like in Austin or, you mm -hmm. know, some other city where it was really prepared. prepared. Well, the thing about F1 that I understand is that you know, you have to get into the stories. It's like NASCAR. I mean, if you just watch a bunch of cars going around a track, it's boring. Four left turns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's boring as hell, and F1's the same. <laughs> but if you get into the drivers and the history and what who they are and, you know, the battles, and then you can start rooting for the people. So you have to be kind of yeah in depth. Um, I don't know. The whole thing with Vegas was, I think it's a great idea. I mean, well, crazy. the night lights, the lights at Everything night. Everything about makes it makes it work theoretically. Yeah, and I just I hope that it they figure out how to make it work because it's too. Yeah. pretty much over the top, right? And we walked around and the the truss work and the lighting to do that. I mean, it was unbelievable the amount of gear and work that was put into. Putting that yeah. thing on is just ridiculous. So, fr from a lighting point of view, and like your world and what you guys do at Stage Right, what's like the new thing? Is it the big LED screens like the the yeah. sphere? Um, I'm sorry, we're getting so far off track. No, is this yeah, good? I love. I actually love this interview. This is great for me. I don't care if you may care, but I could care less if one person watches it. Oh, that's cool. So I'm. I'm well, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, me know. too. <laughs> I re really am. You know, I was talking with somebody the other day. It's like, you know, any topic that's about you, you know, that's the best topic. Yeah. You know, we're all, I, I guess all we really care about is us. <laughs> and, you know, the, if you want to have a good conversation with anybody, you talk about them, you know. Yeah. All of that. Um, so 
Uh, yeah, this is a great time for me if we're talking about me. You know, please, I want it. That's exactly what we want to do. <laughs> but I, you turned the tables on me in the first thirty minutes, asking me questions, which I was like, man, he flipped this on me. Well, I, I didn't mean to. I'm yeah. just fascinated yeah. by how we got here, and yeah. you know, why are you doing this, and what do yeah. you do outside of this? You know, yeah. so. I'm fascinated. If, if I could figure out how to make a bazillion bucks a year just talking to people, yeah, uh, and and there be no strings attached, can we somehow get Rogan involved? Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> can we be your sub podcast? Yeah, yeah, how do we do that, Joe? <laughs> yeah, does he have Joe Rogan franchises? You know, <laughs> <clears throat> that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um. Uh. Back to. Uh, Lighting and, yeah. and 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 stage right um, there. What what excites us? What's the new technology? You know, um, oh, I remembered. I I wanted to another crucial story was you know COVID for us was that's why that's why I started this. It <laughs> changed everything. Right. Um, and you know, going into COVID, even you know, my staff was like, well, what would you? What are we going to do? And I was like, um, I don't know if we want to have that conversation because <laughs> it's not going to be good for you or good for any of us. You know, if this thing continues on, I'm thinking about where I'm going to store all this gear because I know the landlord's going to be like, you can't afford rent. You guys got to get yeah. out. And what are we going to do? Um, Trying to put a lien on your equipment. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you always want to protect you know, people working with you and, you know, take right. care of them and make sure that, you know, they're good. And I've just realized at the time period, like, I may not be able to do this. This yeah. is, this may really be bad. And um, so, you know, we got, we did a neat thing, kind of like you did the podcast. We um, decided that, you know, we had all this warehouse space, so we might as well, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to monetize maybe broadcasting. And we invited some original bands to come in and we streamed live oh, concerts wow. out of our, our warehouse. And it was called uh, Six Feet um, Together was the concert series. And Dave, that's brilliant. Well, <laughs> we thought it was going to be brilliant. It sounds brilliant. You're telling me it didn't work? Uh, no. Financially, no. It oh, was fine. awesome. Okay. It was an Awesome. It's like a podcast. This doesn't work financially. But. Yeah. Well, we, you know, I'd spend my days calling around to, you know, car dealerships got incredible amounts of money. And, right. you know, because the government infused a bunch of money into the economy, people were buying cars. So during right. COVID, car dealerships were killing it. And uh, so I was calling them and saying, hey, you know, we have all these, uh, you know, people that work in our industry, the, you know, from the stage hands, you know, they're completely out of work. There's no concerts, there's no events, you know, these guys yeah. can't feed their families, you know, it, it devastated them. So we thought, well, hey, why don't we go to these people that are successful and, you know, plead the story of, you know, our industry and we're going to broadcast, you know, live music entertainment and, get you to sponsor it and we'll sell sponsorships and so we you know pushed and of course you know nobody's wanting to give any money to anything. write check for anything yeah because they're like you know are just scared shitless yeah. <laughs> it, it sucks for you guys we're doing okay but it may be that you know six months from now we are not doing okay and so if i write you a check and i might be like right. Man, Hey, I need that money back or something. You know what's funny about that? I was just reading about uh, Charlie Munger. Do you know who he is? He's uh, Warren Buffett's partner That's was kind of the behind-the-scenes partner. Mm. And Charlie just passed away. I think he was 90. Fact check me, Jack. He was either 93 or 99. I think it was 99. But he has a famous quote that's actually been given to, to Warren which is when other people are greedy, be fearful. Hmm. And take, take the mindset of these greedy people who, and, and you think about it from an investment point of view, greed causes prices to go up. Mm -hmm. But when other people are fearful, 
prices go down. Be greedy. And so that, that mindset, there, yeah, there's Charlie Munger, 99 years young, um, wow. br- brilliant uh, number two to Warren Buffett um, and was his partner for more than 50 years. And that in and of itself, to have a partner in anything from marriage to business is pretty amazing. Mm. Um, you know, I've got a beautiful partner, my wife, for 31 years, and every day I'm thankful that she puts up with me. <laughs> I, you know, business, I had a business partner, and I was like, man, this, this is a partnership that doesn't float anymore. Mm, sinking ship. Sink, and I, I want to get out. Mm. Um, and th- that's not always. So it's, you know, tip my hat to those guys, salute them for being able to. That's uh, a massive testimony to their relationship. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so you're, you're, you're talking to these car dealers. Oh, yeah. And, um, and so we ended up, um, our insurance company, um, Morgan Merrill, fantastic. Yep. Yeah, They're right, right around turn. the corner. <laughs> Ned yeah. Morgan is awesome. Um, you know, he, he heard my plead and he said, hey, you know, we're, we're doing okay. We'll, we'll give you some People money. still got to buy insurance, yeah. yeah. And so we advertised a snot out of him since he was the only one that actually invested in our show. We broadcast probably, I think it was like eight weeks. Um, and it got out there. And we did, it was amazing for us as far as developing the technology. And the, the XR studio that we'll be building next year came from that. Tell um, me, what is XR? What does that mean? It's a virtual studio. So, okay. you know, when you see the sporting events and stuff like that yeah. and the the commentators are all sitting around a table and the floor is changing and the walls behind them are all video screens and changing. Um, uh, that's kind of like an XR studio, but, um, the movie or the, the show. Oh, sorry. Uh, live events. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife always tells me, put your phone on silent, you know, like when we're going to dinner and here I am on a podcast with this thing working. That's all. That's awesome. Sorry about that. Um, so the TV show, The Mandalorian. Yeah. Have you seen Star that? Wars spinoff, yeah. yeah. That entire scenery set is virtual. It's it's a video screen. What? Yeah. So when you see all those. That? Yeah. Do you know that, Jake? Of course you knew that. <laughs> and um, what's the gentleman's name? John... Favreau, he he's an actor, but he's also he kind of has kept Star Wars alive. Do you know who I'm talking about, Jacob? Um, John, yeah, I think it's John Favreau. Favreau, he um oh he's got pictures of the set. You're gonna put that up on the podcast, Jake, where you can share yes. that. Yeah, it's on now. So, Dave, you're telling me you've got something similar to this? Well, no, we've played with this, okay, um, because we had the video wall. Um, well, I'll I'll try to organize the the backstory so we started broadcasting um you know the bands and we had a video wall behind the bands and it was just kind of running ooey gooey cool looking stuff on camera but um you know we enjoyed shooting and broadcasting so much and it was crazy because you know camera people that do film work and stuff like that we had you know three or four different uh, guys that came out of the woodwork to shoot this and you know I I was like you know you guys sure you want to do this um, you know this is taking away from your time and your trade is very expensive you know it would cost us tens of thousands of dollars to do this and they're like yeah we'll come do it and I'm like you, you realize there's no money in this and they're like no that's fine and when you know Morgan Marrow gave us some money I think a thousand bucks we ended up buying pizza for the guys um, for all the the Friday nights. And then we set aside some money that we could um, donate to the stagehands that were suffering and, um, you know, do the, do what we were supposed to do, Um, you know, with the money that we had told, you know, these people, Hey, we want to do this broadcast. And uh, it was interesting. The first one, they actually had a, like a, um, it was Bennett Wales and the relief 
they actually kind of spearheaded this and we just mm-hmm. piggybacked on it. Um, and they put like a donation thing on their broadcast yeah. and people could uh, send them money. And they actually, you know, made a few dollars, you know, doing it. Nothing, you know, we're talking like $50 or $100, right. you know. Um, so uh, when we, we started this, um, Bennett had made this comment, you know, they were playing and giving their hearts and they're in this warehouse and there's, you know, cameramen, but there's no audience. Right. So they would finish a song and be like, you know, there's crickets, there's no cheers. And Bennett made this comment and he was like, this is so bizarre, you know, we finish performing and there's no noise. And then he had his phone because he was watching his stream and he was like, oh, there's a couple of people on my stream. And I went, oh, we need to figure out how we can broadcast the show and they can interact with their fans. So we took the video wall and we set it up in front of the band and then we had people zoom in to the broadcast. And so while the band's performing, they're looking at a video wall that's a bunch of people sitting in their living room watching them perform. And wow trying to get the technology to work yeah. so that it was feeling, you know, more live right. um, and interactive was the catalyst that's leading us down this road to creating this XR studio. Anyway, it was so fun. Um, you know, the bands that followed up after that um, really interacted with the video wall and they could hear people cheering and talking, but it was also funny because you know, people at home during COVID, you know, they're wearing pajamas, you know, the kids are eating popcorn. Um, they're not really knowing that, or they don't know what they look like on camera. They're, they're staring at a screen watching a band perform and that camera on their computer is showing them sitting in their living room. And it was hilarious. Some of the things that you would see in people's oh, houses, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, any so, exhibitionist, <laughs> Not, uh, that would have been interesting. But no, um, there wasn't enough thought. You know, <laughs> nobody figured out. Hey, we could really have fun with this. Um, anyway, it was great. And and uh, you know, when COVID started um, loosening up, and people, can I stop you there? Yeah. The, the the NBA did that. And, you know, when they had the guys, you know, coming back to court and they were playing in the bubble, is that what you're talking Like they had fans and the fan experience where they were broadcasting the players, but in the background were all these Zoom calls who were dialing in to watch the game. Oh, could they um, see the – And they could the, see the players, but you, the cameramen – you know, I mean, could the players see the? Um, oh yeah, they had this audience. whole this wall. I remember seeing cutouts in the. Uh, they used to take cutouts and set them in yeah, the, the stands. F- so flat, flat Fred or whatever. Yeah. It was. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. No, we didn't. We we were making this all up. We actually got Magic involved guy, yeah. with Zoom and were dialoguing with them about you know what we were doing and because there was video was great but the audio would start cycling and it would start that feedback loop if they... Kind of that robotic bandwidth wasn't wide enough. Yeah, and um, it would start looping. So the people would have their uh, speakers on and their microphones on and they would start this loop of audio. And it it was awful. And then we would have, you know, if we had like 30 people into the broadcast we had 30 opportunities for creating this loop so we were trying to get zoom to give us some kind of control so that we could shut off people's microphones and that was crazy but it was it was a great exercise you know with with them and we thought wow this is cutting edge we're talking to zoom what's what's COVID? one of those instances as a businessman where you're like this is going to get me this this is going to end this is it yeah yeah so you had some moments like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, even in the financial business, I was like, uh, I'm going to shut my operation down and be, you know, a, a work-from-home advisor, which I enjoy working from home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but th- yeah. there was a part of me where I was like, gosh, to your to your point, I've got people that I employ. I've got people on my payroll yeah. who I, are depending on me to, to make this happen. 
And I'm a little bit of a, you know, people, my head's in the clouds, you know. I'm not in reality, you know, <laughs> this fantasy. And I I knew we were going to figure it out. I mean, we pivoted. We started this broadcast. We, you know, we were trying anything to survive. And I, I went into a, this planning of, all right, what am I going to need to come out of this? Because there is this is going to end. Something's going yeah. to happen. I mean, we're right. going to get through this. And so I kind of identified 10 people that were part of the company that I said, I absolutely need these people to come out of this so we can survive. And, you know, we, we come, kind of came up with a game plan. I mean, uh, I would say I favor being a conservative person, you know, um, and, you know, the government, I'm always, you know, hey, less government, you know, more right. capital. P pick up my trash and defend my borders. Yeah, that, that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> but the government really rose to the occasion. And, I mean, I wouldn't have made it through if it wasn't yeah. for what the, you know, uh, D.C. did for trying to keep, you know, the economy going. Right. And um, when they put, uh, you know, the extra $600 a week into unemployment, yeah. and I realized that some of my employees were actually going to make more money on unemployment than yeah. they were making with us, you know, I told everybody, you know, go get on, on unemployment. And a lot of the people were like, you know, oh, well, we don't want to do that, you know. You know, that's the bottom of the barrel. They were brought up, you know, if right. you're going to be on unemployment, you've hit rock bottom. And I was like, yeah. no, this is actually a financial opportunity yeah. for you guys. So we got them all on unemployment and, you know, suffered through um, and was really tight with those 10 people going through the whole process. And then we heard, you know, uh, a lot of these people wanted to create, you know, outdoor you know, I separated six, yeah. you know, feet together, movie nights and uh, outdoor, you know, anything outdoor, large format, a lot, lot of separation, a lot of safety. And so it was all video walls. So we were getting these calls and we, um, going into COVID, we had just purchased our first video wall. Um, and a video wall is like an LED. Yeah, big, screen. huge. Yeah. You know, when you go to a concert, that big screen that you can see the artist, you know, on yeah. the back of the, the stage. The jumbotron type exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And so we had we had stepped from lighting into a little bit of that, doing that video stuff. And we weren't a video company. We were a lighting company with video walls. And um, so we started getting phone calls for doing this large format outdoor stuff. And I was like, man, this is... We got to invest in this, and I don't. I don't have a clue why any financial um, institution said, "Hey, Dave, we'll give you some money to go do this." <laughs> coming out of COVID, you know, with a, a months of you know no income, and so we kind of threw a hell mary and said, "Hey, you know, let's let's go for it." If yeah, we don't survive this, you know, and we go bankrupt, you know, no harm, no foul, I guess. <laughs> ruined credit and life but anyway um we started getting calls and started doing this outdoor format um with these big video walls and uh like cape henry um had movie nights and they would have their football field full of you know families isolating and they opened that up to the community or just like their family no, of uh, students the, just for the students and stuff wow and so you know we started generating revenue coming out of this thing and was like hey this is working and then being on the cutting edge of this it it started generating more and more business and then yeah. we just kept investing 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 and throwing money at it and um, knock on wood it's it's panned off it's taken us you know from going into covid kind of a flat company where we you know we're just making um just the same rate year yeah. after year to all of a sudden our revenue was doubling and you know tripling and it was just that's beautiful crazy what would you say to a business owner today who's um not necessarily doesn't have to be in the lighting industry but just a, a business owner who's right at that edge of like man 
I, I, I can either just capitulate or I can just go go all in. Are you one of those guys who are like, hey, if I know what my worst case looks like, which is complete and utter failure, are you an all in kind of guy? Yeah. What would you what would you say to another business? Oh, owner? I'm all I'm definitely an all in kind of guy. I don't even you know that closing up shop and you know being destitute that I don't even think about it. It's right. not on my radar. Everything is all in. Um, a fantastic uh, another guy you need to interview Brian Milliken. Um, he owns okay. a company called uh, Four Stage Rentals. He's got a great story. Um, he Br- was Brian Milliken. Milliken, Jake, you you writing it down for me? Yeah, he's Four Stage Rentals. Is he here locally? Yeah, he's okay, and he's the best person. I mean, I'm boring. He, he would no, bring you're excellent man. You've been he would great he would bring people to the podcast. I mean, was, everybody loves Brian. He's just the greatest guy. Um, anyway, he and I kind of built our businesses together, and he is a very smart person, and he built his business with a very good foundation, and most of it was like cash, and so he never was in a stressful situation. He okay. was solid, and if... He he always had his uh, eye on you know hey if this collapses I'm prepared you know yeah um, and he would look at me and go you are an idiot you <laughs> <laughs> you know if I had a credit card and it had open balance I was buying something you know and he's like dude you know you're gonna end up having to pay for that and I was like yeah we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my parents really enjoyed talking to me, you know. <laughs> my, anybody in my life was like, you are crazy. Um, but anyway, he built a... Fan- Business owners, by the way, have to be a little bit crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you look at the stats, if anybody told you, hey, go start a business, but statistically, according to SBA, there's a 95% chance that you're going to fail. Yeah. But go start a business. Yeah. <laughs> We have a, we we are some crazy sons of bitches over here. That, well, I was listening to your story coming out of the military and then starting this financial thing and then getting into the other uh, business that you know I just I don't know how you did it. I look at you crazy. and go, wow, crazy. That's I read financials and if the financials look good, I go, okay. Listen I'll, I'll to what you it. just said. I read financials and financials look good. I'm I'm just like, oh well. Hey, that that looks like a real cool toy. Let's buy it. Maybe it'll make yeah. us some money. Serban oh. told me I was effing crazy for buying that business that was a contractor for. Oh, really? Steel. Yeah. He was like KP. Don't do it. He's been one of my best financial advisors in life. Oh, really? <laughs> You're professionally his financial advisor, but he's been your. He's been yeah, and we we laugh and joke about that all the time. We're we're in a little. Um, capital venture deal together that we've jumped into. Um, and I'll tell you a, a fun story. I didn't mean to cut you off, but it, this is just, no, this is our see. friends that we can chat through. So years ago, COVID, you know, that all that's kind of happening. And we're down in um, San Antonio, Texas, visiting my son, Noah. And he's like, hey, and I'm the financial guy, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't know shit about crypto, really. I know I have an understanding but I'm not in it. I'm not buying anything yet. I'm watching Bitcoin. I'm watching one of my clients be really successful with Bitcoin. But on a scale of 1 to 100, Bitcoin actually ranks as a 99 in terms of risk. If 1's your lowest risk and 100 your highest risk, Bitcoin is 99. Mm -hmm. Cash is 1. So I'm, I'm not that type of advisor to my client. I'm more, you know, vanilla. How do we stay boring but make a lot of money? So my son's talking to me. He's like, Dad, um, there's, this, uh, there's this crypto coin out there that's got a lot of, you know, on Reddit and Quora, uh, Quora and a, a bunch of other feeds out there. And he geeks out on that stuff. He's like, you need to buy this. And by the way, this is not financial advice for anybody. I have to give that full <laughs> disclosure. This is a story. So in this story, Noah says to me, Dad, you got you to buy some of this. And I'm like, okay. And we're walking through HEB, which is San Antonio, Texas. Everybody knows Heb. 
it's a, a grocery store that's like uh, Albertsons on steroids. No, Su- no, super it, 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 the hair. Harris Teeter, you know, right? Wegmans. I Wegmans. That's what Wegmans, makes yeah. my wife go Wegmans, crazy. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. So we're, we're walking through the store. We're, we're buying some groceries for the weekend for hanging out with him. And he's showing me on his iPhone uh, Robin Hood. Hmm. Right? So the app Robin Hood. And he's like, Dad, there's this little crypto, and you can buy this cryptocurrency for like point zero 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 one. And I'm like, hmm. I was like, are you doing it? He's like, yeah. And he goes, if I send you this app, you know, they'll they'll issue me a stock and they'll give you a stock, and you can buy um, some of this crypto. Hmm. So I'm like, okay, Noah, well, you know, let's play the game. So. I, I download the app. I get. I don't even know what stock I got, but then I was like, okay, Dogecoin mm-hmm. or Do is it Doge? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, Doge. This is a Elon thing. Elon, yeah, going to the moon. Um, so I I look at this coin and there's no financials. There's no background. It's complete speculation. So I buy a million and some odd coins. Holy crap. But for point zero 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 zero, it was a dollar, it was, right? <laughs> it was. Uh, I, I think I had four thousand bucks in this thing. Holy crap! You went in. I went in. I was like, you know, I'm gonna gamble on this. It's Ooh. speculation. I've got a little bit of money on the side. We'll, we'll do this. Dang. Um, and then it became became like this um, this family thing. Jake bought some. My son Isaiah bought some. My wife Kathleen bought some. And it was the the stupidness of of cryptocurrency, right? Mm-hmm. And this is where you're talking about, you know, you just can't, you can't care. At some point, mm-hmm. as a businessman, you just got to go for it. Now, this was not a go for it moment for me. It was, hey, I'm blessed, and I'm wanting to do something fun with my son mm-hmm. that we, you know, we can create this community. And uh, I, I buy this coin. Well, lo and behold, Serban calls me while I'm walking through the grocery store making this purchase. And I'm like, hey, dude. I'm going to tell you some really stupid financial advice. He goes, well, it wouldn't be the first time, Kenny, that you've told me something stupid that you did that I didn't do, like buying ProPat. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. And so we're bantering back and forth. And then he texts me a little while later, and he says, I, I put 1000 bucks in. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got ever how many coin that bought for him, a couple, you know, 250000 or whatever. So about a year goes by, <coughs> excuse me, and my my four thousand dollars is now worth about triple mm. that. Look at you go, financial advisor. Yeah, right. And I'm like, dumb luck. Mm. I'm going to take a lot of this off the table. So I I sold a million plus coin, mm. right, and made some money. And I told my son Noah, hey, you should probably take some off the table. And, Jacob, I don't know what you did with yours, but my son Isaiah forgot about his, and he just had a, a few few hundred, and I think he had a hundred bucks in it. My wife had maybe a hundred bucks in hers. Serban had a, a shit ton of coin, right? A butt ton, I think, is the proper English term. <laughs> so I got out of mine. I didn't say anything to Serban about it. I, I actually had forgot about it. Mm-hmm. And then one day I turn on um, the TV. One evening I turn on the t- TV, and Elon Musk is on one of the Tonight shows talking about Dogecoin. <laughs> and I pop up out of my seat and go, "Oh my God, this is going to literally go to the moon just because he's talking about it." Mm-hmm. And I I open up my phone. And it's at 70 some cents. I, well, yeah, it got to 72. It was already at like Holy 70. Crap. My dumbass, six months before that, thought it was at its peak. Wow. And I, I dumped it. I immediately, and I wish I could show this on screen. I, I'll, we're going to interview again. We'll, we'll, cool. we'll talk this. But I, I show Serban, that's where it's at today. Um, yeah, go back to what year is that? That May 14th. Yeah, that's 2021 right there. So I think you bought and sold right here in February. Mm. 
June yeah, of 21. That, that's about, it was just under seven cents. That's right. And then that was when Elon talked about it there in May of 2021. And it was at 60 some cents? No. So that went from, what was that? Uh, 0.06 to 0.6. Yeah. I know it got up to 70. So 100%. 70 some cents. Anyways, I call, I call Serban. And his account is high, 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 six figures, almost seven figures. Holy crap. For a thousand bucks. And I'm like, dude, dump it. Get out. And he was like, ah, yeah, I'd, I'd forgot about it. I'm just going to let, let, let it ride. And you've seen the ride. Yeah. He doesn't care. <laughs> right. But we had a chuckle out of that. I was like, this is the best financial advice I've ever 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 given you given you <laughs> and you, you know that's a lifetime investment he's done some things a lot better than that but um the, the point being is that th- that type of ride and those types of things is that people have bet the farm in speculation mm-hmm. and you you know going back to that thought of 95 percent of people fail mm-hmm. the well if you don't try you've automatically failed right yeah. So you you have to be you have to have the kahunas in business no matter what you're going into. Mm-hmm. Make the effort because the only other choice is doing nothing, and that in and of itself, if you've got yeah, a yeah. vision, you've got a dream. Would you subscribe to that as a business owner? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. The failure wasn't really an option, you know. I I never even could consider it, you know, and. You know, you hear all these um, really successful business owners that say, hey, you have to really fail, you know, uh, to succeed. And, you know, uh, it's a numbers game and, you know, you fail four or five times and eventually you're going to hit something. And you learn so much by failing. You know when to get out of something that, you know, is a bad deal. And, um, you know, I always thought, well, you know, I haven't really failed yet um is that a bad thing Uh, no i don't think so i mean i think there are some people out there who just hit their stride and stay in it i I think my my whole thing was tenacity you know i was stupid enough that i just yeah i'm gonna keep doing it everybody's (laughs) like this is stupid why are you doing it i'm just gonna keep doing it um well you know to that point dave i had a marine corps gunny uh gunnery sergeant hall at fast company who had a statement to me that has impacted my financial career probably as much as any other training or any other thing I went through mm. was the statement that he made to me. Um, and I don't remember the instance of what had happened, but it was so impactful, it stuck. And all he said to me was, Porter, be smart enough to listen, but actually dumb enough to go do it, <laughs> dumb enough to go charge the hill. So if, if, if your gunny, if your sergeant says charge the hill, mm-hmm. he's got he wants to go home and see his family too. Mm-hmm. Right? So if he's telling you to charge the hill, he's charging the hill. Charge the hill. Just be dumb enough to go, I don't know what's on the other side of this berm. But I'm doing it. I'm doing it, and I got my boys with me. We're, we're going misery loves company. Mm-hmm. Let's go. And so in business, sometimes you just got to be willing to charge the hill. Yeah. I'm not sure what's on the other side. Now, it doesn't mean you're reckless and careless, but sometimes if I, uh, the unknown unknown Mm -hmm. is favor, right? Mm -hmm. Not knowing what's out there, but knowing that I'm just going to go, go get it. Mm -hmm. And I know the outcome, worst case, is I don't make it. Well, if it kills me, I'll be in heaven looking down on it and you've hit the jackpot in heaven anyway. Mm -hmm. Here on earth. Well, I've always got an opportunity to start again. And that's been my mentality as a business owner. I don't want to fail, Mm -hmm. but I'm not afraid to fail. Right. And uh, I've always thought of failure as something that's falling forward. Now, there have been times like when that crappy thing happened with with Steel, it tested my resolve. Mm -hmm. You know, there was about 90 days where my wife was like, who the hell are you? Mm -hmm. What's happened to you? What? You have you have shrunk to this human being who appears that you've given up, mm-hmm. and it was well, like when questioning she, everything. Yeah, too. yeah, when she said that, and she was like, "Pull your big boy pants up and go back at it." Mm. I'm like, "Oh, 
That's a good wife. She, she is an excellent, excellent wife. She is. She is the best. Right, Jake? She's not, my, better, she's not my wife. You better she's get mom, the... She's the best. She's a good she's mom. Right? She's a great mom. <laughs> yeah. uh, she's a much better wife than I am a husband, right, Jake? That's that's what you can... Uh, don't Easy how fast you answer that. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you're also not my husband. Dad, so. uh, yeah, the smart guy over there. Um, Dave... I like, I like that guy. He's, he's, he's excellent, and I love having him here. It's great. Um, you know, thinking about it, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of close this out today with the thought of um, if you've got any parting thoughts for up-and-coming businessmen, and I, I do sincerely want to have you back on the show. It's oh, been a pleasure awesome. talking to you, and uh, I want to know more. Um, I want to know more from you, so if we we'll can do, keep doing yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, is great. If we got to do it in the camera, if we got to meet and we just throw these headsets on and do it, that's just I'm, hang out in I'm the down. Starbucks. Why not? <laughs> Look at those two guys. Um, but uh, if, if you were trying to help a, a, a young man who was, if you think back to you, you know, 20, 30 years ago, starting out, what advice would you give the 21 year old Dave? <laughs> Well, have fun with this, you know, get a job, don't do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, uh, another audio company gentleman who was starting his own business coming out of COVID and he'd been through some struggles and, um, you know, he had reached out and we chatted through stuff and I was like, you know, the, this statement of start your own business, it'll be great, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. You'll have tons of fun. I forget the whole. St- We're gonna have to edit this, and I'll have to come back with what the actual statement is. But you know, mm-hmm. it'll be great. Start your own business. Um, we say that to each other all the time because you know, that getting into business, you just don't have a clue of where it's gonna take you. Right. And you know, you go in like I. I wanted to be a lighting guy, and actually, what my day to day is is HR and administration and right stuff that you're just like, why do I have to go do this and you know, I, I, the girl that's you my... You envy the position your employees are yeah, in because they're, they're doing the fun thing. stuff. They're playing with my toys, right. you know. I want to play with my toys. Um, and I I teasingly, the girl who runs the company, the CFO, the person that really, you know, keeps me on the rails, um, Jenna, is she's fantastic. But I, I apologize to her all the time. I've said, I've ruined your life, you know. <laughs> you, <laughs> you signed on with me and I've wrecked it, you know. You... you I apologize, but, um, you know, it's not for the faint of heart and, uh, you really have to, you know, believe in what you're getting into and commit. And, you know, if, if you're passionate about it, um, and you're not, you know, looking for maybe the paycheck or, you know, you just want to have your, uh, good quality of life, then you can create something that's, you never, um, you never go to work. You always yeah. just continue your day of having fun and, you know, hanging out with your friends and doing stuff. Um, so definitely think about what you're getting into. Um, but, you know, I'm a balls to the wall, you know, no holes barred, you know, do it, dive in, rock and roll. Love it. Um, and that may not be the best thing, you know, the best way to approach a business. Um, sounds like you're a numbers guy and you yeah. do your due diligence and take a look at the opportunity. But you're right, like charging the hill, you know, you um, you want to be smart, but also you want to be dumb enough to just go ahead and, yeah. and, and do it. You, don't, you know, don't get caught up with overanalyzing things. You know, 100% of, agree. A lot of gut, you know, yeah. go after it if you feel like. We've made million-dollar decisions on just, I think this will work. <laughs> <laughs> we might be okay with this. Yeah, and sometimes to that point, from a financial point of view, there are things in financials that will scare the hell out of you, mm-hmm. that will lie to you about what it could be. Mm-hmm. And it really comes back to that individual who's who's steering the ship um, you, you know you got rough seas ahead. Are you just ballsy enough mm-hmm. to, to plow through and do it and be okay with, with failing, be okay with your ship sinking? Yeah. Some people, and I, I think for the majority of people who don't have that DNA to be a business owner, 
the thought of their ship sinking, the thought of things just capitulating, crippling. Yeah, crippling, and they can't can't do it. And that's that's where um, you know, kind of the, the the thought process of the you know there are those who teach and there are those who do. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I've seen that in my career. I've seen folks who are well, by far more educated mm-hmm. than me. Um, and brilliant people that I look up to for their brilliance. But if I ask them to start a business, well, let's let's go into this venture together. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, 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 mm-hmm. that's that's too risky. Yeah. Um, so I t- tip my hat to you um, for coming through something like COVID. Yeah, that, that seems crazy. like you know years ago, <laughs> and I feel like I lost like it was like two years of my life. Just I'm like, what happened during that period? Mm-hmm. Um. But for the business owners like yourself who uh, went through trial and tribulation with that and came out on the other side, uh, I salute you mm. and uh, congratulate you for, for making it. And um, I'm glad that Ian and Sarah introduced us mm-hmm. Yeah, um, because I, I truly would like to have you back and we'll get into more of the meat. Jacob's got your website up here, and so we'll give you a little shout out. I oh, appreciate that. To, to stage right. Our website's terrible. I mean, our 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 um, weddings website, the girls that take care of that are fantastic. That website and those guys, yeah, that's great. We're proud of that one. The, the rest of it is, you know, we just haven't taken the time to get into doing it right. But thank you. Thank I, you. I wish my, my website looked that cool with, like, all the, the cool pit. L- lighting is everything. So when you think about telling a story, you guys are a major part of your customer telling their story. Mm-hmm. And when the lighting's right, I mean, it, set, it really does set the mood and set the stage. Yeah, we're very, we, we really respect, you know, um, our clients and what they're trying to accomplish. And we feel very, you know, um, humble that they're, they're coming to us to share their big giant event and you know it's an honor to be able to help them yeah. develop their dream so it is how can uh, someone contact you if they want to they want to know um is there a form to fill out on your website can yeah they there's call you? there's phone numbers forms you know all of the text messages emails uh, so they can reach out at info at stage right virginia or va.com yep, yep. or and 757-431 4501. Is there a specific person they should talk to first? Um, it, it depends on what they're looking for. If it's okay. a special event, uh, Casey and Sydney are special event people, and they're fantastic. Um, and they have a direct line, which is 757-431-1122. Awesome. And that gets to them. But, um, yeah, we need to do better on our, our social media. And it's tell, your, tell your story, man. That, that's an that's awesome shot right there. What was that shot of? You remember what that scene? I actually don't. Know That's that. really cool looking. A lot of the concerts, the guys take fabulous pictures out on these shows. You know, yeah. I, I they'll send me pictures, and I'll be like, "Holy crap, we did that!" <laughs> well, one of your guys, Ian Miller, my son-in-law, if he ever gives you any shit, <laughs> he is amazing. You, you let me know, and do I'll you, call his daddy. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how blown away that he? I'm. He comes to work at our building. I'm like, what? This is awesome. I mean, he was out on Stranger Things, and he's, he's done, done some great shows. Unbelievable yeah. work, and I'm really looking forward to as we open up this XR studio. That's going to be yeah. Ian's baby, and he'll. Well, I'm I'm not um, I, I'm I'm not saying anything. That I don't know that Ian may have said to you, but he's he's talked great things about you. It's how we've met and here today is. He's like KP. You got to talk to Dave. He's a really oh, interesting really? guy. Um, so I'm, I'm buttering well, it dang. Like, yeah. And, I'll, uh, uh, yeah, he's like, definitely, he's got a cool thing going. He's done some great, cool stuff. And I, it made me curious. So uh, I was like, cool. well, let, tell him, let's talk. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad this was fun. I, f- I felt like, wow, you won't want to talk to me. You were, the, you're, this is your rock star moment, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> bring your guitar <laughs> next time. I know I'll, <laughs> I'll sign autographs and there's but, been some crazy artists that's come out of this region though. Right? Did you grow up here? Uh, 80s. I was a military yeah. kid, so we moved around. There you then. go. Another yeah. military connection. Yeah. In fact, um, my 
father-in-law. I never can, is it stepfather, father-in-law, whatever. My <laughs> father-in-law, my wife's um, father is a uh, two-star admiral, retired. He has fascinating okay. stories. Um, can we I, get him in here? Oh, I, he I would love, love talking it. to veterans. Oh, he would love There's it. There's a cool interview I'm doing. I, I, can't, I can't tell the audience who this person is, but he's one of the most decorated Navy SEALs oh, in wow. all history, and he's a very close friend of mine and client. He gave me the honor of documenting his story for his mom and dad who really have never known his 31-year 31 career, 31 career. Wow. She and his dad asked him when he goes, what did you, what did you do? Yeah, exactly? what did you actually do? And so he's now 55. I'm sorry if I quoted your age wrong, dude. Can't say his name. But we're going to shoot his memoir oh, wow. in here and just talk about his career. And, you know, the Clint Xbox is going to come out. Mm. Um, but I am getting, I'm doing that next week. Oh, wow. How and, exciting. You know, me, Jake, Ian's going to come help me. I think I might be pulling away a day to go do this. You fucking bastard. <laughs> <laughs> that must be awesome. But he's going to help. We're going to do some movement with Cameron because he's going to have some of his gear and stuff. And oh, wow. Stories behind it. But it's only going to be for his family, his siblings, and his children. Wow. It's not, and, you know, we're signing NDAs, and, you know, it's his content. Wow. But I am more excited about doing that for him. That's great. And for his family, because those stories need to be told. Need to be captured. They need to be captured. The republic depends on people knowing the history. There's so often, I'm, my, um, I I was married before, and um, her stepfather was also a two-star. Wow. um, Admiral, and uh, they wanted to get, you know, I think they gave him books and wanted him to write his stories and tell his stories, and he would sit at cocktail parties and tell stories, and we were all riveted, and it's a shame that they're gone, and, you know, the the memory is just... But your father in law is still still Yeah, there. he's great. And and we do we would need to do that. That would be fantastic just to hear his stories. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, like my father and was your just, studio, man, would be a great place to yeah, do that with some of these some vets. Cool stuff. Yeah. Um yeah, we, that thing can't come soon enough, man. I'm just dying to get that thing. Sounds so cool. But um but like even my father, um, he was a spook. So he can't talk about anything that he did. And it was like, Yeah, you know, what what did you actually do during the day? And we just have no idea. Well, that's this this client that I'm telling you about is like, dude, this this may cost me. Mm. He goes, but I'm I I owe it to my parents. I'm I'm doing this for them, and they're aging, and they're uh, in their their late eighties, and time's ticking. Wow. And this community here, I mean, this is where they all are, yeah. all the people that have done things through this. Surrounded by people I have massive respect that I would say are like my earthly heroes yeah. of just it's incredible. great veterans. So thanks to your, your father-in-law who served yeah. your father, and uh, it's, a, it's a big part of my life. So That's awesome. I love well, it. Thank you for serving. and you know, I tell people all the time, they paid me. <laughs> yeah, I was dumb enough to listen, sign the contract, and went and did it. Yeah, that's one thing I, you know, I just made rock and roll lights and sound and stuff. Cool. And <laughs> I, we we need to stop. Okay. But who's your all time favorite band? Uh, you know, is, is there one or is it? Uh, there's a. How ton. about genres? Who's? Well, growing up, it was bands like Rush, and you know, today oh, no, is Perks. yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> and uh, you know, today is all the country music. You know, it's just awesome. you like country music. Oh yeah, yeah, I love country music. Anyway biggest star crushes like we did keith urban i was just telling that story and serb and keith are really good friends oh really yeah. oh that serb serbs like you know everybody's like you should know him i'm like yeah, i love an autograph you know he's stratosphere I'll, I'll hook you guys up one day and oh that'd be fun you know go for coffee yeah well that's that's crazy i mean we we did keith urban's first headlining concert here in virginia beach and so just imagine you're an opening act for another artist and you've climbed up the ranks in popularity that you're outshining, you're headlining, and uh, artists said so they put you on your own tour. <laughs> and he played here for the first time. And it, there's a lot of neat stories about, um, you know, when you do that, you, the stage is yours, everything is for you. And Keith came out and the band jammed for like an hour. And it was just, they were just 
blissfully happy and uh, being there and you know going hey keith you need anything are you good and he was just like this is awesome and you're <laughs> just like you're awesome and you know i'll take that forever you know that was the you know, I, i'm surrounded by and i've been had the pleasure of being surrounded by musicians who have worked in my firm mm. one's a young man uh who started my firm he got fired as many times as my son isaiah who was an admin assistant here for <laughs> before he went in the army his name's zach stein um and he's just a local up-and-coming uh artist who got his start here and, and i tease him all the time that i have a 99 percent royalty deal deal with him <laughs> um but <laughs> that's but, your bitcoin right there that's right come on bud yeah, yeah write I, that song I, and he and Jake have uh, grown up together, playing in church, playing guitar. Um, but you know, Zach, another local kid who will probably, he's in Nashville now, and he's got a little development deal that he's signed. Oh, that's awesome. But there's just been great musicians that have yeah. come out of this region. We don't even have time to talk about them today. But yeah, there's that's crazy. It's the biggest unknown. I mean, with Teddy Riley and Pharrell yeah. coming out of Something here. in the water. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> from exactly. athletes to uh, musicians it's yeah. been a hotbed of great talent yeah and you're you're one of those so oh, thanks for uh thanks and you make those guys look good that's if it. somebody pisses you off you can just switch the light turn on. it off yeah, yeah <laughs> we didn't like that show click <laughs> so. well dave we got to turn it off today right, man this is great so thank fun. you so much thank you i really appreciate it Had a good time yeah we'll chat soon all right Black Box.